Welcome to the FODMAP reintroduction webinar. My name is Marianne Williams and I'm a specialist gastroenterology community dietitian working for Somerset NHS Foundation Trust. You will have already been on the FODMAP diet and it's really important to know that the FODMAP diet itself is only for four to eight weeks. There are three phases to the low FODMAP diet. There's that elimination phase that you do for the four to eight weeks and then there's this reintroduction phase. The final phase is a personalization phase, and that's where everybody has a personal level of tolerance for different FODMAP foods, and you'll discover what that personal tolerance is by doing this reintroduction phase. So all phases of the FODMAP diet should be done with the support of a registered dietitian. However, we realize that for a lot of people, it's not possible to access a dietitian. So we've created this webinar to support patients with FODMAP reintroduction so that they know how to do it and how to do it properly. Why is this reintroduction phase so important? The elimination phase, as I said, must only be done four to eight weeks. And taking these FODMAPs out can actually affect the good bacteria in your gut. Research suggests that it may have a negative effect on these bacteria. And therefore it is absolutely vital that FODMAP foods are reintroduced methodically to a level of tolerance after this elimination phase. It's really, really important. I can't underline how important it is that you do start FODMAP reintroduction. After the reintroduction phase, most people will return to a relatively normal diet with an adapted intake of FODMAP foods in order to minimize their symptoms. But as we said, that's the personalization phase and it's very particular for each patient. One patient may not necessarily tolerate the same foods as another patient. So it's very personal to you. So let's look at the reintroduction process. So the FODMAP challenge or reintroduction process, during this process, you stay on the strict low FODMAP diet throughout. It's a very simple process. You challenge with one portion of a set food on day one, and then you double that food day two, and you triple that food on day three. Very simple. If you've got no symptoms by the end of day three, you remove that food and you move on to test the next food. This process is really useful because if, for instance, you got to, let's say, day three before you start to get any symptoms, then you'd know that actually you can tolerate a fair amount of that food with very little issue. This three-day reintroduction process is really to give you a chance to find out how much you can tolerate before your symptoms return. If you get symptoms at any stage in this process, and I mean very definite symptoms, not just very mild, small symptoms, but very definite symptoms. If you get those symptoms at any stage, then stop at that point, remove the food, wait for the symptoms to pass, and then move on to test the next food. Make a note of what happens with each of the foods, because as you get towards the end, you won't have any way of remembering what happened with those early foods that you trialed. So very important to make a note. If, however, you get through all the way through to day three with no symptoms at all, then you don't need to wait. You can just move on to test the next food straight away. The reintroduction process should take about six to 10 weeks, during which time you'll remain on the strict FODMAP diet throughout. The aim of this process is really that you're learning your threshold level for each food and then you'll be better able to control your symptoms in the long term. So a question we get asked by patients often is, do I have to challenge with every single food on the FODMAP list? Well, the very simple answer is no. There are lots of food on that list that you may never eat, and there's no point wasting your time trying those foods as they're never really going to be a realistic part of your diet. The other aspect we're gonna cover is how much of each of these foods should I challenge with? So if we look at GOS, which stands for galacto oligosaccharides, lactose as well, and fructose, these three FODMAPs, if you introduce one of these FODMAPs, then you will probably be able to tolerate the others in this particular food group. So to give you an example, fructose, we normally suggest people test their fructose tolerance by using either honey or mango. So if you're doing it over three days, it would be one teaspoon of honey on day one, two teaspoons on day two, or three teaspoons on day three. And if you were using the mango, it would be a quarter of a mango day one, half a mango day two, three quarters of a mango on day three. Now, if you tolerate honey or mango, depending which one you decide to try, then the chances are that you will tolerate other foods that just have fructose in as well. 
and you can see a list here. So boys and breeze, fresh figs, fruit juice with more than 100 milliliters, sugar snap peas and agave nectar that's light. So the same applies for the galacto-oligosaccharides. You would start with two tablespoons day one, four tablespoons day two, and six tablespoons day three. And you could choose any one of these galacto-oligosaccharides. For instance, azuki beans, black-eyed peas, butter beans, chickpeas, lentils. With lactose, most dairy products are not high enough in lactose to cause a problem, but milk and yogurt are. So these are the ones that you would have removed or changed in your diet while you're on the FODMAP diet. You wouldn't have had to remove the other dairy products. So when you're coming to testing lactose, you can either choose to test it with milk or natural yogurt. So you could test with 125 mils of milk on day one, 250 on day two, or 375 on day three. And it would be the same with the natural yogurt. If you decide to test lactose with natural yogurt instead, it would be 125 grams on day one, 250 grams day two, and 375 grams on day three. So as I said, with these three food groups, fructose, galacto-oligosaccharides, and lactose, if you tolerate one in these, each of these food groups, the chances are you'll tolerate the other foods that fall specifically into these food groups. Use the same food for each of the three-day challenges. So for instance, you decide to use honey, use honey for the three days. Don't mix and match different fructose foods. And the same with the galacto-oligosaccharides. If you decide to use chickpeas as your tester, then stick with chickpeas for the three days. Then you have polyols. Now polyols are separated into two separate groups, sorbitol and mannitol. In the sorbitol group, we generally suggest you test with a quarter of an avocado. And here we've got three tablespoons of sweet corn. I actually would also suggest that half a corn on the cob would be a good alternative to the three tablespoons of sweet corn. So for instance, on day one, you might have a quarter of an avocado, day two, half an avocado, day three, three quarters of an avocado. If you're using corn on the cob, it would be half a corn on the cob day one, one full corn on the cob on day two, and one and a half corn on the cobs on day three. And here are some of the other foods that only have sorbitol in as well. So apricots, blackberries, coconut, lychees as well. Mannitol is one of the other polyols. And we generally suggest you use celery or cauliflower or sweet potato to do the test. So for instance, with celery, it would be quarter of a celery stick on day one, half a celery stick day two, and three quarters of a celery stick on day three. And the same principle if you decided to use cauliflower or sweet potato. And the other food group there would be mushrooms that you could try for mannitol. Use, as I said before, the same food for each of the three-day challenges. So if you decide to test sorbitol with avocado, then you do avocado only on those three days. Fructans. Fructans are a different group. There are lots of foods that fall into the fructan group. And if you tolerate one, it does not necessarily mean you'll tolerate another one. So if there are fructans that you are missing from your diet and you particularly want to get them back in, then it's important you test each one individually. But there are three major fructans that I want to go through specifically. So bread is one. It's going to be very important for a lot of people to get bread back into their diet. So we suggest you do one slice on day one, two slices day two, and three slices day three as your test. Obviously, if you get symptoms at any point during the process, you stop remove the bread from the diet again, wait till symptoms have passed, and then move on to test the next food. But do make a note. Onion is the other fructan that I really want to look at. And because even if you don't eat onion particularly, you will find it cropping up in meals, particularly when you go out and eat or if you're at somebody's house eating. And you need to know, if somebody's put a little bit of onion in a meal, do you need to worry? So the test that we suggest is one tablespoon of onion on day one, two tablespoons day two, and three tablespoons day three. What I generally suggest is that you have a low FODMAP meal, such as a stew or a casserole or a bolognese, and in that you would put one tablespoon in the whole bolognese or casserole or stew. So if you were making a bolognese, there would be no other FODMAPs in that apart from your tablespoon of onion. And the next day you would make the same meal, but you put two tablespoons in and the next day three tablespoons. So the concentration of onion is increasing in that food each day. Again, if you get symptoms at any point, stop, remove the onion from your diet, or wait till the symptoms pass and move on to test the next food. 
The garlic is the third fructan that I think is really important for people to trial. And again, it's because it appears hidden in lots of meals and you really need to know is garlic an issue or not. The quantities that we suggest for the challenge are a quarter of a clove in a low FODMAP meal on day one. So the same as with onion, you might make a casserole or, or a bolognese and it would have no other FODMAPs in, so no onion for instance, for instance, and you would just put your quarter of a clove on day one. On day two, it would be half a clove and on day three, three quarters of a clove. And you would see whether you get symptoms. Use the same food for each of the three day challenges, obviously, on those foods. But there are lots of other fructans in the vegetable section and the fruit section. And each of these, if you're missing them from your diet and you'd like to get them back in, they each need to be tested individually. And we suggest for each of these that use 40 grams on day one, 80 grams day two, and 120 grams on day three. Use the same food for each of the three day challenges, as I've said before. So tips. What if, what if a food contains more than one FODMAP? So on day one, you would challenge with 40 grams, on day two, 80 grams, and day three, 120 grams. So very simple. Don't forget that too many high FODMAP foods over a short period of time, for instance, in one meal or in a 24 hour period, may cause symptoms. So it may be that on an individual basis, each of the foods is tolerated very well, but when you start to combine them, or you have a high FODMAP meal, you may run into trouble. So to give you an example, if you went out for dinner and you had leek and potato soup with garlic bread and a bowl of pasta, that's an awful lot of FODMAPs in one meal and you may well run into symptoms, despite the fact that when you tried each of those foods individually, they appear to be well tolerated. So it's all about how much can you get away with before you get symptoms. We also look at a very pragmatic approach to the FODMAP reintroduction. And if you find the quantities that we've given you slightly difficult or not realistic for you, then we suggest that you try a half of your normal amount on day one, a full amount that you would normally have had prior to this diet on day two, and then one and a half times your normal amount on day three. So for instance, a lot of people would say that a quarter of a clove of garlic quite simply is not realistic for them. They're normally having three cloves in every meal. So for those people, they might actually have one and a half cloves in a meal on day one, then normal three cloves on day two, and four and a half cloves on day three. So it really is looking at what is the best way for you to reintroduce. There are no hard and fast rules to this process and every single person is different. So in the long term, it's really important to personalize your diet. So a lot of people will end up on what we would call an adapted FODMAP diet, where they've got most FODMAPs back in, but there are several FODMAPs that they have to be careful of, they don't eat too much of, and they're careful not to have too many FODMAPs in one meal. But it is really important to get FODMAPs back in your diet to keep your gut bacteria healthy. So we would suggest including FODMAP foods regularly to the level that they're tolerated. So if you tolerate food after you finish the whole reintroduction process for that six to 10 weeks, when you start to reintroduce foods, make sure that you regularly introduce the ones that are well tolerated. Test mixing and matching your tolerated foods as well. If a food causes symptoms if it's eaten every day, then reduce it perhaps to just three days a week and you may find you tolerate it better when it's eaten less frequently. Include a problem food perhaps within a meal and that may be better tolerated. So when you try it on its own and it causes problems, it may be that if you have a small amount as part of a larger meal that it's actually better tolerated. So that's worth trying as well. We hope you found that helpful. Please see the further information handouts in the IBS section of this website. It's also really important to point out that King's College London have an excellent low FODMAP app. It can take you through the whole dietary process, which is really useful if you can't access a dietitian. Obviously, as we stressed at the beginning, this diet should really only be done with the support of a dietitian. But where that's not possible, uh, tools like this app can be extremely useful. And they also have some little short videos, one of which is specifically on the FODMAP reintroduction process. So I'd really recommend looking at that. Above and beyond that, there's an excellent book produced by Lee Martin, who is a specialist gastroenterology dietitian, and that's called Rechallenging and Reintroducing FODMAPs, a self-help guide to the entire reintroduction phase of the low FODMAP diet. 
that's a really helpful book if you're still struggling with the reintroduction phase. So thank you very much for listening and goodbye.